Chapter 5 of The Life and Adventures of Peter Wilkins Volume 1 Being once on board and in pay, I thought I was a man for myself, and set about considering how to behave. And nobody knowing, as yet, upon what footing I came on board, they took me for a passenger, as my dress did not at all bespeak me a sailor. So everyone, as I sauntered about, had something to say to me. By and by comes a pert young fellow up. Sir, says he, your servant. What? I see our captain has picked up a passenger at last. Passenger, says I. You are pleased to be merry, sir. I am no passenger. Why, pray, says he, what may you be then? Sir, says I, the captain's steward. You impertinent puppy, says he. What an answer you give me, you, the captain's steward. No, sir, that place, I can assure you, is in better hands. And away he turned. I knew not what to think of it, but was terribly afraid I should draw myself into some scrape. By and by, others asked me, some one thing, some another, and I was very cautious what answers I made them, for fear of offense till a gravish sailor came and sat down by me, and after talking of the weather and other indifferent matters, Pray, says I, Sir, who is that gentleman that was so affronted at me soon after I came on board? Oh, says he, a proud, insignificant fellow, the captain's steward. But don't mind him, says he. He uses the captain himself as bad. They have had high words just before the captain went on shore, and had he used me as he did him, I should have made no ceremony of tipping him overboard. A rascal. Says I, you surprise me, for the captain sent me on board to be his steward, and agreed with me about it this afternoon. Hush, says he, I see how it will go. The captain, if that's the case, will discharge him when he comes on board. And indeed, I believe he would not have kept him so long, but we have waited for a wind, and he could not provide himself. The captain came on board at night, and the first thing he did was to demand the keys of Mr. Steward, which he gave to me and ordered him on shore. The next morning, the captain went on shore himself, but the wind chopping about and standing fair about noon, he returned then with my chest and before night we were got into sailing order, and before the wind, with a brisk gale. What happened the first fourteen days of our passage I know not, having been all that time so sick and weak I could scarcely keep life and soul together, but after grew better and better. We prosecuted our voyage, touching for about a week at the Madeiras in our way. The captain grew very fond of me and never put me to hard duty, and I passed my time under his favor very pleasantly. One evening, being within sixty leagues of the Cape of Palms, calm weather but the little wind we had against us, one of our men spied a sail, and gave the captain notice of it. He, not suspecting danger, minded it little, and we made what way the wind would permit, but night coming on and the calm continuing, about peep of day we perceived we were infallibly fallen in with a French privateer, who, hoisting French colors, called out to us to strike. Our captain had scarce time to consider what to do. They were so near us. But as he had twenty-two men on board and eight guns he could bring to, he called all hands upon deck, and, telling them the consequence of a surrender, asked them if they would stand by him. One and all swore they would fight the ship to the bottom, rather than fall into the privateer's hands. The captain immediately gave the word for a clear deck, prepared his firearms, and begged them to be active and obey orders. And, perceiving the privateer outnumbered our hands by abundance, he commanded all the small arms to be brought upon deck loaded, and to run out as many of the ship's guns as she could bring to on one side, and to charge them all with small shot, then stand to till he gave directions. The privateer being a light ship and a small breeze arising, run up close to us, 
first firing one gun, then another, still calling out to us to strike. But we neither returned fire nor answer till he came almost within pistol shot of us, and seeing us a small vessel, thought to board us directly. But then our captain ordered a broadside, and immediately all hands to come on deck. Himself standing there at the time of our first fire, with his fusee in his hand, and near him I stood with another. We killed eight men and wounded several others. The privateer then fired a broadside through and through us. By this time, our hands were all on deck, and the privateer pushing in hopes to grapple and board us, we gave them a volley from thence that did good execution. And then all hands to the ship's guns again, except four who were left along with me to charge the small arms. It is incredible how soon they had fired the great guns and were on deck again. This last fire, being with ball, raked the privateer miserably. Then we fired the small arms and away to the ship's guns. This we did three times successively without loss of a man. And I believe if we could have held it once more and no assistance had come to the privateer, she had sheared quite off. But our captain, spying a sail at some distance behind the privateer, who lay to windward of us, and seeing by his glass it was a Frenchman, was almost dismayed. The same sight put courage into our enemies, who thereupon redoubled the attack, and the first volley of their small arms shot our captain in the breast, upon which he dropped dead without stirring. I need not say that sight shocked me exceedingly. Indeed, it disconcerted the whole action. And though our mate a man of good courage and experience, did all that a brave man could do to animate the men, they apparently drooped, and the loss of the ship became inevitable. So we struck, and the Frenchmen boarded us. During the latter part of the engagement, we had two men killed and five wounded, who died afterwards of their wounds. We who were alive were all ordered on board the Frenchmen, who, after rifling us, chained us two and two and turned us into the hold. Our vessel was then ransacked, and the other privateer, who had suffered much the day before in an engagement with an English twenty-gun ship of war, coming up, the prize was sent by her into port, where she herself was to refit. In this condition did I and fourteen of our crew lie for six weeks." till the fetters on our legs had almost eaten to the bone, and the stench of the place had well-nigh suffocated us. The Gloriot, for that was the name of the privateer who took us, saw nothing farther in five weeks worth her notice, which very much discouraged the men. And consulting together, it was agreed to cruise more northward, between Sierra Leone and Cape de Verde, but about noon next day they spied a sail coming west-northwest, with a fresh gale. The captain thereupon ordered all to be ready, and lie by for her. But though she discerned us, she kept her way, bearing only more southward. When the wind, shifting to northeast, she ran for it, full before the wind, and we after her with all the sail we could crowd." And though she was a very good sailor, we gained upon her, being laden, and before night came pretty well up with her. But being a large ship, and the evening hazy, we did not choose to engage her till morning. The next morning we found she was slunk away, but we fetched her up, and hoisting French colors, fired a shot, which she not answering, our captain run alongside of her and fired a broadside. Then, slackening upon her, a hard engagement ensued, the shot thumping so against our ship that we prisoners, who had nothing to do in the action, expected death, one or other of us, every moment. The merchantman was so heavy loaded and drew so much water that she was very unwieldy in action. So, after a fight of two hours, when most of her rigging and masts were cut and wounded, she struck. Twelve men were sent on board her, and her captain and several officers were ordered on board us. There were twenty-eight persons in her, including passengers, all of whom, except five and the like number which had been killed in the action, were sent 
chained into the hold to us, who had lain there almost six weeks. This prize put Monsieur into good heart, and determined him to return home with her. But in two days' time his new acquisition was found to have leaked so fast near the bottom that before they were aware of it the water was risen some feet. Several hands were employed to find out the leak, but all asserted it was too low to be come at. And as the pumps, with all the labor the prisoners, who were the persons put to it, could use, would not reduce it, but it still increased, they removed what goods they could into the privateer, and before they could unload it, the prize sunk. The next thing they consulted upon was what to do with the prisoners, who, by the loss of the prize, were now grown too numerous to be trusted in the privateer. Fearing, too, as they were now so far out at sea, by the great addition of mouths, they might soon be brought to short allowance, it was, on both accounts, resolved to give us the prize's boat, which they had saved, and turn us adrift to shift for ourselves. There were, in all, forty-three of us, but the privateer having lost several of their own men in the two engagements, they looked us over, and, picking out two and twenty of us, who were the most likely fellows for their purpose, the remaining one and twenty were committed to the boat, with about two days' provision and a small matter of ammunition, and turned out. End of chapter 5